This video is going to be about turning these into these so we can build this and mount it here. The parts are made on this little converted Precision Matthews PM30 hobby mill and it's running a Centroid Acorn control. The first step is to model the tablet with the power adapter installed. Next is the fun part. This is the design of the frame wall mount itself. The design on the left was the first and I thought it was kind of clunky and boring looking. I was a lot happier with the second design but didn't love the way these corner seams came together. And the third design is what I landed on. I wanted the screen to be easily removable from the wall. I've got these speakers with really slick magnetic covers. They just sort of snap in place when you get them close and I wanted to do the same kind of thing with this screen. So these two brackets are gonna be 3D printed and have magnets pressed into them. They're going to live on the wall and be mounted with screws from the front. They also locate the tablet by fitting into this kind of rectangular recess on the back of the case, and they hold the screen to the wall by pulling on magnets in the same spot underneath on the case itself. It's made up of four parts, the left, the right, the top, and the bottom. The left and right parts have two setups, or operations, but the top and the bottom have three, because we've got to mill out that long slot that the tablet fits into. Each of these stations corresponds to my double vice setup on the mill, so that's why it looks like this. The top and bottom parts of the frame are about 12 inches long, and we've got to hold them across two vices, so it's really important that the fixed draws are aligned with respect to one another. I've got mine dialed into about a thousandth, and I think that's about as good as I can get on this PM30, and it's plenty accurate for this. I like to do all the cam in one big assembly. It lets me visualize exactly what's going on from operation to operation, and part to part. All the cam is in these folders on the left here. So for the left part, I've got these three folders. For the right, I've got these three. And you know, for the top, I've got everything in here and the bottom, everything here. The machining's pretty straightforward. All the parts are nice and square so we can hold them in a vise without having to make a fixture plate. For all the parts, we're gonna just put the stock in the vise, machine everything we can from the top, flip them over and finish machining from the bottom. There's one additional step for the top and bottom parts, which is going to be milling out these kind of long slots. All the tool paths for the right part are in this folder, and here's a quick stock simulation to show what we're hoping to end up with after this first operation. We put the stock down on some parallels in the vise and load up the probe. This is the S5000 LED Drewtronics probe. It's accurate to within a thousandth of an inch and amazingly good for the price. With the probe loaded up in the mill, we go into the centroid control, hit setup, part, then we go into probing. We're going to probe this part in as a web feature. I know the approximate length of my stock is seven and a quarter inches. I like to overshoot it a little bit, and this clearance amount is how high up the probe moves over the part as it's probing the web feature. I like to keep it at about half an inch. We orient this graphic so that the stylus is sitting to the left of the part, and then we jog the probe over to the part on the machine in the same position. Once the probe's in position, we hit cycle start, and we get this message to verify the function of the probe. I hit it a couple times with my finger, which generates these warning messages in the Centroid dialog box, and we can be sure everything's working properly. We hit cycle start, and off we go with the probing routine. When the probing cycle finishes, we get this kind of readout message, which gives us the length of the part and the center of the web uh, in the X direction. So the center of the web is 5.5153, which matches what we have in the DRO. This just makes it real easy to zero out the X axis in the current position that the machine's sitting in. Now we go over and we've got to do the same thing in the Y direction. So we go next axis, probing, we probe it in as a web, we're going to orient this graphic so that the stylus is sitting to the bottom of the part, sort of in the Y direction, and we jog the machine over to the same position. Now popping back into the control, we enter the web width. Again, I like to keep the clearance amount at about half an inch. We hit cycle start. We've already verified the function of the probe. We hit cycle start again, and the probing routine starts. Now we get the length of the web, 1.6369, and then the center of the web sitting at 1.0898, which again is the same reading on the DRO, making it real easy to zero out the y-axis. Last is to do Z. So we go next axis, auto, we hit cycle start, and we've already verified the function, hit cycle start again, and off we go.
With this last probing routine finished, we get this X0Y0Z0 readout on the DRO. So the point that this ruby is touching on the part is our first work coordinate offset, which matches what we've got in CAM. We go ahead and post the code. This is just turning the tool paths into G code for the control, which we can see here. We load up the file we just posted, press cycle start, and the control is asking us to insert the Tormach Superfly for the first facing operation. This footage is sped up, but we're running at 2500 RPM, removing a 20,000 skin off the top, and we're doing it at about 10,000 feed per tooth. This is HDPE plastic, and you can push the tool a lot harder. To get a nice surface finish, I had it running slowly. With the facing finished, the control is asking us to insert the Tool 28, which is a 3 8 3 fluid aluminum end mill. I'm using the Tormach TTS tool holding system, which has a ground shoulder and uses ER collets to grip the end mill. The reason I use these is because it makes tool changes a lot easier. When you run straight collets, you've got to adjust the uh, stick out or the tool stick out offset in the control every time. We're running here at a depth of 7 8 and doing 3,000 feed per tooth at 3,000 RPM with a 50,000 step over. You can run the tool a lot harder than this. What you see here is 100,000 step over with the same settings. Uh, you know, we're doing 3 8 step there though. I haven't really found the limit at which you can remove plastic. No matter what the feeds and speeds are, it seems to remove pretty easily. I'd call it a good practice material if you're looking to get into this. This helical ramp is stepping down at 2 degrees with 3,000 feed per tooth and 3,000 RPM. Again, it's a 3 8 3 fluid end mill, and those are half-inch holes. HDPE is a funny material. Sometimes the chips come right off with none of this stringiness, but this black stuff is really kind of gummy and stringy, so I use a deburring tool, or a 45-degree chamfer tool, to uh, deburr the part wherever I can. It comes off real nicely on the machine, not so easily by hand. This is a 764 ths drill. It's plunging at 15 inches per minute, running at 3,000 RPM. Again, you could probably plunge this at any speed you want. I haven't found the limit. With the parts still on the machine, I like to test all the fits I can in case there's something I gotta tweak. But these are half inch magnets. The holes are 510 thou. So there's 10 thou clearance for the magnets to go in, and they're gonna be held in with countersunk screws from this side. So we flip the part over in the vise and remove all the stock material from the bottom. Again, this is the Tormach Superfly running at 2500 RPM, 10,000 feet per tooth with a 50,000 step down. Now you keep hearing me say that this tool can remove material really quickly and all I do is take these small cuts. Well, this time it's because that piece isn't held so rigidly in the vise. With all that material removed, we've got to probe the part in again with respect to the machine features on the part. Um, the next step is going to be to put on the corner chamfers or break the edges. And without this piece accurately located with respect to existing machine features on it, the chamfers end up coming out looking really bad. They'll be really big on one side, really small on the other side. Ask me how I know. Take the part out of the vise. looks pretty good. For the right part of the frame, the process is the same. We load up the stock, probe it into position, zip off the top of the stock, and then machine as many features as we can from the first side. We test the magnet fits, flip it around in the vise, and then we remove the material from the other side. The process is much the same for the longer top and bottom frame parts. We take a lick off the top with the Tormach Superfly, machine in as many features as we can from the first side with the 3 8 3 fluid aluminum end mill, that's the chamfering end mill. Then we do a little bit of drilling, and the part ends up looking pretty good, but I did run into a problem when trying to flip it around to do the second operation. So we know these faces are pretty true to one another, but the problem comes with the height offset. There, you can see we've got about a 25 thou variability between the heights of uh, the vice jaws, and this is kind of just what you get with these really, really cheap Chinese vices. Now, a little trick I use to get around things like this is to use machinable vice jaws. So I took off the steel jaws, here I'm installing some aluminum jaws, and then I can sort of machine the heights so that they match, as well as machine in sort of little steps that you'll see here in a moment to grip the workpiece. Now, it's not really ideal to have to do this for every job, but I often have to use little tricks like this when holding parts across vices, especially when the height is important. Now, so in theory, this is about as good as I'm going to get uh, between vices on this mill. The vertical surfaces are dialing in again to within about a thou or two, and the tops to within about two thou. It's not perfect, but it's about as good as I'm going to get. So now we can flip the part over in the vise. We probe in again, 
and with the Tormach Superfly, we remove all the stock material from the back. And it came out looking pretty good. Now, the additional operations that we've got to do for the long top and bottom pieces are milling out those long 3-8 slots that the tablet is going to sort of slot into. So we probe the workpiece in, into the same work coordinate offset that we've got in CAM. And here we're slotting with a long two flute quarter inch aluminum end mill. It's a 3-8 slot. I'm ramping at two degrees here, 3000 RPM, removing 3000 feet per tooth. And uh, I should have, again, done this a lot harder. I would have ramped at a steeper angle. These definitely needed some manual deburring, but at the end of it all, they both came out looking pretty nice. Now with all the parts machined, it's time to assemble everything. This is usually the part where I'm mostly holding my breath, but in this case it worked out. Here I'm screwing in the magnets to the right upright of the frame, tacking the corners together, and everything seems to fit pretty nice. I left a 10 thousandths gap between the tablet, sort of all around the perimeter, just to make sure I had a little bit of give. To mount the brackets, I'm using these drywall anchors for number six screws. We've got two magnets that are pressed in. Now, I don't need to screw them in because they are gonna sit against the wall so they can't fall out and all the forces will only sort of push them further into the pockets, which is nice because they can be really slim and not push the tablet too far off the wall. And it fits pretty nice. The magnets definitely hold it firmly enough so it'll never fall off the wall, but not too firmly that it's difficult to remove. Now, one thing I haven't yet done is bring power to this tablet. Now, the reason that I built this case with room for the power adapter is because it's pretty important to me for this thing to have power all the time. Without it, I just think it'll sit around dead and I won't always remember to put it back on the wall. You don't see it in the frame, but the screen is mounted right above a light switch, so it'll be pretty easy to bring some power to the tablet. This tablet is running a dashboard for my home assistant instance running on a Raspberry Pi lets me control things like lights, thermostats, heaters, other relays around the house. You can make automations based on the time of day or the weather, humidity, air temperature, whatever you want. It's a cheap system to get up and running and lots of fun to keep building out. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video.